This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Brian Alexander. He is a former columnist for NBC, number one best-selling author of his most recent book, Glass House, The One Percent Economy and the Shattering of the All-American Town. Brian, welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Good. Give us a sense of geography. Tell us where you're located. I'm currently located in San Diego, California. Fantastic. I used to live there myself. Beautiful place. (laughs) So the 1%, we've all heard a lot about the 1% since the Occupy Wall Street movement. Tell us about the premise of, uh, of the book. Well, the premise of the book is what happens to a town when Wall Street gets its hands on a primary employer, or in this case, employers, in that town. And what is the social fallout, the economic fallout, the cultural fallout of that? And the reason I did that is because Lancaster, Ohio really stands in for a couple of hundred other towns all over, uh, especially the middle part of the United States. Mm-hmm. So Lancaster was the sort of town that inspired the book? Is that? that that's correct. That mm-hmm. happens to be my hometown where I grew up. Okay, great. So what happened there? I mean, did Wall Street, did certain companies there go public or they were acquired through roll-ups or M&A? What, what happened? Well, it, it focuses on a company called uh, Anchor Hawking Glass. Anchor Hawking was a Fortune 500 company, one of the very rare Fortune 500 companies located headquartered in a small town. At its height, it employed about 5,000 people there. It was the world's largest manufacturer of glass tableware, the second of glass containers like uh, bottles, mayonnaise jars, baby food jars, that sort of thing. And it had plants all over the United States. It was a big deal. And what happened, to make a long story short, is that in early 1980s, Wall Street discovered it, and a guy named Carl Icahn, who many oh, yes. of your listeners may be the, familiar the cor- with. The corporate raider, Carl Icahn. The corporate raider, <laughs> yep. He decided to pull what was then known as a green mail move right. on anchor hawking. And the effect of that wasn't so much financial directly, but it created a cascade of events that eventually led to leveraged buyouts by two different private equity companies that decimated the company and started the erosion of the town. Okay, so before we get to that, let's make sure we just let's back up a little bit here and let's talk about green mailing. He gave money to the board of directors. Is that tell us what green mailing is? I, you know, I remember green mailing is uh, you've got company XYZ and you make a widget and I show up and I say, guess what? I now own 5% or more of your stock, and I am going to demand board seats and a variety of changes and things that you may not like. Or you can give me a premium for all this stock that I have purchased, and I'll go away. Mm -hmm. In other words, I pay $10 for your stock. But if you give me $13 per share for your stock, I'll go away and leave you alone. Right, right. So in other words, they do that to prevent the hostile takeover, right? Yes. Okay. Then you mentioned leverage buyouts or otherwise known as LBOs. and, And that's the practice of sort of using the company's income to buy the company, right? <laughs> it's a pretty incredible Well, deal. roughly speaking, yes. Yeah. What you do is you, you borrow a bunch of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have the money to buy the company. Right. So instead you borrow the money, but that is not your debt. You create a shell company and you force a merger with the shell company is the thing that entity that borrows the money. You create a merger and then the new entity has all that debt. 
So you as the, in this case, private equity companies, that's not your debt anymore. That is the debt goes on the back of, in this case, anchor hawking. And mm -hmm. when you do that, you handcuff a company. Right, right. So they can't really move when they're saddled with so much debt, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so tell us what happens to the town now. So that's kind of what the dynamics of the, of the company and Carl Icahn's corporate raider activities. And, you know... Look, we've all seen probably both of the Wall Street movies, which sort of depict this behavior. You know, we were all familiar with this stuff that happened, you know, starting, I guess, starting in the 80s, really, or at least pop being popularized in the 80s. And it's debatable, I guess, if this is good or bad, if it, you know, it's certainly good for the people who do it, they make money, but is it good for society in terms of the company itself and layoffs and splitting up companies and so forth? But then there's the actual geography, the town, right? And I don't think anyone really thinks too much about that until your book came along. And this sort of maneuver has a variety of effects. So when you have a town that's a relatively small town and you have major employers like this, there's a whole social web that springs up as a result of these companies being there. There's a symbiotic relationship. And so you have executives that live in the town. Their kids go to the local school. They go to school with the factory workers' kids. Their wives, in the old days at least, their wives were the civic heart of the town. I got the polio vaccine because a bunch of these wives got together and said, well, the polio vaccine is now developed. We need to get our kids vaccinated. They created levees to make new sidewalks. They passed uh, school bond issues. They were involved mm -hmm. in the town. Right. Another thing that happens is that workers have a pathway to the future. They're at a stable company. They know that if they advance in the company, they're going to make a decent living. They're going to be able to send their kids to a, a decent state college. They're going to be able to buy a better house. And, and so they see this, this future. And there's a lot of town pride. You know, you would say to people, hey, I'm from the town where Anchor Hawking is based. And people from Tanzania, Africa to Japan use Anchor Hawking glassware. And that, that Budweiser beer you're drinking comes out of an Anchor Hawking bottle. And when that stuff starts to go away, people become dispirited. And they are open to wanting, over a period of about 35 years, they become open to electing somebody like Donald Trump, for example, who says that he's going to bring it all back somehow. Okay, so so sounds like you're not a Trump fan, I'm guessing. <laughs> no, I am not a Trump fan. Okay, all right. In terms of the town, I mean, I totally appreciate all the things you're saying. And I'm someone who constantly watches and recommends that my listeners watch old TV shows and old movies because it is mind-boggling how far we've come or maybe how far we've decayed as a culture. You know, again, debatable. But things have certainly changed. And, you know, look, I mean, couldn't someone argue that, hey, you're being sentimental. That's how the world used to be. I know there were nice things about it, sense of community. I get it. Totally, totally get it. But everybody now has to just hone their skills and, you know, go with a much faster moving society, right? Uh, isn't that just the nature of things? Well, that's what some people argue. In order to argue that, though, you've got to say that community no longer matters. Right. We are a social species. Mm -hmm. And I believe that community matters a great deal. Oh, I do, too. And I'm, I'm sad to see it go away. In fact, I look at just my own life and the way community has just evaporated. But, you know, there are so many causes of that. I mean, I know your book examines the Wall Street component, but social media and, you know, it's a big world and a much more mobile society. And, you know, there's a lot more to that than just just the Wall Street component, right? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And in yeah. fact, the book does discuss some of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying that all the world's problems are laid at the feet of private equity companies. Yeah. What I am saying is that towns like Lancaster, companies like Anchor Hawking have become the feedlot for people to scrape money away mm -hmm. and leave damages behind mm -hmm. without consideration of what this is doing to people and what this means for us as a society. Right, right. Okay, so take us through more of what it means for us as a society or, yeah, I think that's maybe the place to go now. Well, look, if you decide 
that your only goal in life is to enrich yourself or enrich your investors. You know, this is often referred to by the Milton Friedman dogma of shareholder value. If that is the only goal you have, and Friedman uh, advocated that business ignore a lot of their social responsibility, saying that they had very little social responsibility, and their only responsibility is to shareholders, to create shareholder value. If that's the only thing you're looking for, and we live in a capitalist system, I believe that that is a recipe for doom. I believe that that businesses should certainly try to make money, should certainly try to have a profit, but that there is a social responsibility when you have a business and you have employees and you have a, a location and a home base. You owe things to that community because no business survives all by itself. We as Americans have actually fostered business through a variety of initiatives, a variety of tax outlays to try to develop a healthy business economy, healthy capitalist economy, and we deserve some things in return for that. One of them is fairness and the concept of a social contract. And a lot of business today seems to feel that there is no social contract. Right. I I would agree with you. You know, I think this could actually be divided up a little bit more. You know, the Milton Friedman argument about shareholder value, I I know he was behind that idea. But since the uh, recent passing of Jack Bogle, the founder of uh, Vanguard, and, uh, you know, the democratization of the stock market, you could argue, I've been really looking at some of his work and I'm uh, almost finished with Vogel's book, The Battle for the Soul of Capitalism. And he distinguishes very nicely in that book between owner's capitalism, otherwise known as shareholders, right? The, The Friedman idea and manager's capitalism. And, you know, with what you said, one could argue that it's really manager's capitalism. You know, that's not necessarily creating that much value for the shareholders. It's the bigwigs, the elitist, that make all the money in those deals, right? Yeah, maybe a little trickles down to the shareholders, but there's definitely a disconnect between the Wall Street insiders and the common shareholders. Now, the guy that gets the, you know, the Carl Icahn that gets the premium green mailing the board, sure, that's different. He's in a different class, you know. During the Great Recession, when Warren Buffett bought all that B of A stock, it wasn't like the common investor could get that deal he got. You know, same with the Goldman Sachs stock that he bought. So there really is a disconnect between this elite insider Wall Street class and the everyday American investor, isn't there? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you and I go to our our little neighborhood broker and, and he does not have insight into any of these sorts of deals. You know, uh, oftentimes when it comes to private equity, the actual investors in private equity are large pension funds, for example, because what they're trying to do is beat the stock market. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of dispute about whether or not they actually do beat the stock market. But the point is that they have many millions of dollars to divide up and invest in a variety of ways, one of which is to Uh, invest in a private equity firm that then goes out and buys companies in these leveraged buyouts. The average investor who's got a thousand dollars to invest, that's just not available to them. So there is definitely a a two tier system when it comes to investing. Oh, it's, it's even worse than that. I would argue that the average investor that's got a hundred thousand or a million dollars doesn't get that deal either. (laughs) You know, it's it's the billionaires that get that deal. You know, it's a total inside game. I mean, you know, it's just not even, it's not like the thousand dollar guy doesn't get it. Nobody gets it until you're at the super elite class. But, you know, I think you can trace all this. I mean, I think at the core, you're talking about, you know, greed, right? And it could really be traced back from what I can tell to Edward Bernays, the guy that really sort of invented modern public relations and advertising. And maybe that was around the 20s when this happened. That's when people got greedy. Like everything I research says that Americans were just pretty normal before that. They just wanted to live a decent life and, you know, have some progress and, you know, over time gain some wealth. But now this has turned into this hyper- wealth consciousness. And, you know, I would argue it's not healthy. I don't think it's healthy. So I'm, I'm going to agree with you there. I think you'll agree with me on that. But it's just pervasive. It's, it's not just Wall Street, right? 
I date it to uh, the beginning of the Reagan administration. So uh, what happened with the Reagan administration was a variety of deregulation that had been really sort of put in place in the era of the New Deal. And the Reagan administration lifted lots of these regulations. For example, the idea that companies cannot uh, buy their own stock. Well, that's what companies do all the time. And if you look at the current Trump tax cuts on corporations, they didn't use that money to invest in new R&D and hire lots of new people. They used that money in share buybacks. And now in an era when CEOs are compensated in options on shares, sometimes much more than any actual salary, they have an incentive to buy back those shares because it raises the stock price. That's just one example. You have something called carried interest, which is what private equity lives on. Carried interest is a loophole that says that the money they make does not count as regular income. It counts as a rate that's taxed at a lower rate than regular income. That's called the carried interest loophole that private equity guys get. So they have an incentive to do these outrageous leveraged buyouts. And what they also do is something called, for example, the dividend recap. And so what they do is that, you know, they control a company, let's say Anchor Hawking, and this did happen several times at Anchor Hawking. They control the company. They want to squeeze some money out of the company. So they have that company take out more debt and they pay themselves a dividend out of this debt. So they may say, okay, we're going to take out a $30 million dividend recap, and we are going to take 15 or 20 million out of that 30 for ourselves. That's using debt that then goes on the company to reap a payday for themselves. This kind of stuff happens all the time. I know. It's manager's capitalism versus owner's capitalism. The owners of those shares that own most of them, the general public, all right, uh, and the various retirement funds and so forth that the general public is part of, they're not reaping most of the benefit of that. It's the managers. The managers right. are the ones exploiting that system so terribly. But you And know, what, you, what you end up with, however, yeah. is great disillusionment, a feeling of helplessness and oh, hopelessness yeah. Yeah. on the part of average people. Right. You know, the current drug crisis in America is not just because heroin is widely available and very cheap. It's because people say, why the hell not? Right. I want to feel good for a while because I'm yeah. going nowhere. No, it's you know, the a, it's suicide a rate among yeah. men yeah, yeah, um, between the ages of 20 and 60 is skyrocketing. Why is that? Yeah. Well, I believe it's because they see no real future for advancement for themselves because they're being blocked. I would agree with you. And, you know, that's uh, especially this that suicide rate among middle-aged white men. They're yep. the ones that are the biggest victims of that. So it's really quite tragic. But when you talk about the Reagan era, I mean, you also got to ask compared to what? Like before the Reagan tax reform, for example, there was all kinds of malinvestment with doctors, you know, buying these nonsensical windmill investments that really did nothing. Now, I know that technology is better nowadays, obviously, but uh, and, you know, we don't need to go there debating wind power or not. But but the point was there, there was all this encouragement in the old tax code before the Reagan Reagan reforms, right, to, you know, do a lot of malinvestment. And that wasn't doing anything good for the economy. It was just scams to avoid paying taxes, you know. So yeah. there's these things are very complex, aren't they? Certainly they are. But we as a nation decided at the beginning of the 80s, actually really started in the very late 1970s, but the Reagan administration is a convenient place to take it because of the changes in laws that occurred there. We decided that we were going to sort of adore powerful, rich CEOs, and they became almost like movie celebrities. Well, Hollywood did that. I mean, that was Michael Douglas right. and Wall Street, right? You know well, that. but it was also yeah. Jack Welch, a GE. There, yeah. I mean, we, we made sort of titans out right. of these guys, sure. and we assumed or we came to believe or we were told that cash equals virtue or cash equals brains. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't. I mean, these people say that they are business geniuses. A lot of these private equity guys say that they're doing God's work. What they're really doing is messing up sometimes good companies. Well, and you could you could argue the same thing with the Silicon Valley elitists, too. These really scary tech companies, you know, we revere these people like they're gods or something. And they're just people that are abusing our privacy rights 
And uh, yeah, they, they do invent some cool stuff that changes our lives, but it's like this winner-take-all thing. The way capital formation works in this country, and probably around the rest of the world, I guess, I, I don't know enough about it to say, but is that it always goes to this winner-take-all, this crowding out. Look at Howard Schultz at Starbucks. He's crowded everybody out of the market. You got to eat and drink Starbucks poison if you want to go to a coffee shop. There's just, there's just <laughs> nothing else left, okay? You know, and... Uh, well, it, you know, there's a whole other issue to talk about that we could, if you wanted to, about economic concentration mm -hmm. and growing economic concentration. You know, Facebook is the current uh, whipping boy for that cause and not without justification. Oh, I yeah, mean, total um, justification. Facebook is yeah. disgusting. So, so we do Google have too. some serious issues. And there are people who say, well, we should just have unfettered capitalism. And make no mistake, I consider myself a capitalist. Capitalism brought about 50 years of incredible prosperity, not only to this country, but a lot of other countries following World War II. But what we have now is a runaway vulture capitalism. We, it's a perversion of what capitalism should be. Right. And my belief is that we ought to start asking what it is that we want capitalism to do for us. And if we want capitalism to make lives better, to improve our lot on this earth, then it currently it's failing and something needs to be done about it. Okay, so what can we do? Let's, let's uh, wrap it up with some action steps. Well, okay. Well, so here's a perfect example. And don't so say write just, your uh, congressman. <laughs> They're part well, of the you, problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, we should, uh, the government should, somebody should close the carried interest loophole. So what effect would that have? Just Well, uh, it, would, it would eliminate a lot of this incentive to do these leverage buyouts. Okay, so so there'd be fewer, there'd be less M and A activity if we eliminated carried interest loophole. Well, there'd be less leverage buyout activity, and there wouldn't necessarily be less M and A activity. There would be less carried interest. So these dividend recaps, they count that as carried interest, for example. So do that. That's one big thing right there. And there was a movement to do this during the Obama administration, but they chickened out. Donald Trump actually ran on closing. They carried interest loophole and chickened out. So let's do it. Let's close the carried interest loophole. That's a big one right there, right off the bat. All right. So that'll mean fewer leveraged buyouts, which will mean fewer buyouts. We all know if you can't finance something, you're going to get less activity. But I'm not saying that's good or bad. I, I don't know, honestly. Can you name a second one? Is there another step? Yes, you can create. And this was something that was that has been done, but in my opinion, not enough you can create a mandated longer holding time. So for example, a private equity company would buy another company like Anchor Hawking and try to turn it around in two years and sell it. You know, it's like uh, house um, flipping. They would try to flip the company off to uh, another buyer or do an IPO within a very short period of time. And then oftentimes the company would fail subsequent to that. There was a new law saying that You've got to hold these companies for a little bit longer. I would suggest that we lengthen that time even more so that you can't just go around flipping companies like this. Another one is uh, pension reform. So a lot of times what happens is these private equity companies buy up a company like Anchor Hawking. There's a pension there. They short the pension. They have the company declare bankruptcy yeah, and they wipe that, away their pension disgusting. obligation. That is so disgusting. I can't believe they can get away with that. You know, that right. And, and so that becomes the obligation of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which at this moment is yeah. in a crisis because yeah. so many of these maneuvers have occurred that a lot of pensions are really at grave risk at the moment. Right there is the perfect example of disgusting manager's capitalism, <laughs> you know. And, you, you know, you could argue like with Vogel's uh, book, right? It's all the stakeholders in a company, right? And there are three main audiences. There are employees, and I'll put employees and vendors in one group. And then there are shareholders, and then there are uh, the owners, the, I guess the owners that are managing the company, you know, the, the managers. And so now we've got this imbalance of managers capitalism and the managers are always owners too, but we've got this massive imbalance. I mean, you look at like Lou Dobbs book, War on the Middle Class, and it's just insane. The disconnect between typical worker pay and CEO pay. It's absurd. It's just beyond absurdity. <laughs> you know, they're just untethered completely untethered now. Yeah, they are. Uh, we need good, sensible regulation in this country. 
And for a while now, we've had this dogma that any regulation is bad regulation. On the contrary, we need good regulation. The problem with regulation, though, is the government always end up, ends up picking winners and losers, and it's favoritism by lobbyists, right? And so that really, I don't know if that works. I mean, I almost think that maybe you should just deregulate everything. I, you know, it's just, I don't know. You, you can never tell how this stuff's going to play out until you do it. That's the problem with things. There's always a lag, right? You change the law today, one way or the other. And then it takes five years to figure out what happened. And there's a new president by then and a new Congress. And <laughs> Well, I, I disagree. I think regulation can work. For example, one of the best regulations ever was the Glass-Steagall Act. Yeah. yeah and well, we had a long yeah. period of decades of yeah. very safe, solid mm -hmm. banking. Yep. We, lifted the, we lifted the Glass-Steagall Act. And then all the banks and we became got the speculators. 2008, 2009 yeah. recession. Right. But some would argue that that was caused largely by the Community Reinvestment Act. And that took a couple decades to play out and, you know, from Carter to Clinton to the Bushes. And, you know, that caused the mortgage crisis, right? Because ah, it's complicated stuff, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> hey, give out your website and tell people where they can find your book and all of your work. You've got other books as well. I do. Uh, so this book is Glass House, The 1% Economy and the Shattering of the All-American Town. The book website is glasshousebook.com. My website is Brian R. Alexander, all one word, dot com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian R. Alexander. And there you go. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Very spirited discussion. We really appreciate having you on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, heartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.